walk away with something that you can possibly even use in your projects. Um, so what I will show you is uh, a platform we have at DeepAI, the company that I'm a co-founder of, um, called Zendo. And it's an AI agent that you can easily teach uh, a visual recognition task in like a short amount of time. So it's something also, that like, you could- Also, uh, invite link for Zendo. Oh, uh, I have to add you all as, like I have to send, I have to add your emails. We have like private invites for, oh, you'll send it up. Cool, great. Yeah, that yeah. would be awesome. Um, so anybody who wants it, like either way, like I'll have to like send, it's like generate some of their emails. Um, so, or I can give you a link, Claire, that you can add people's emails to uh, people that want to get their emails. I've sent an air table form. You could join. It's completely private. No one will see except me. Perfect. Um, okay. So before I, we're going to do like a quick overview. Um, we're going to talk about different applications of AI. Uh, we're going to talk about how you guys can use that in your projects. Uh, we're going to talk about computer vision specifically. Um, and I'm going to show you how some basic visual recognition tasks work. I'm going to show you how to use Zendo and then we can actually start playing with that. If you guys have um, projects in mind, you might want to use it with, you can just upload images, start showing Zendo examples and it will start how to learn um, to recognize the things that you're showing it in totally new images it's never seen before. Um, but before we jump into that, uh, I want to send you all a quick link. Um, just spend a couple minutes reading this really short article um, and we'll talk about what you think. And then we'll dive into some of this intro stuff. So give yourselves like just like three, four minutes to read this. Um, and then as you're finishing up, raise your hands. I want to hear what you guys think about it. Um, let's talk through it. Oh, I shared that privately, uh, not to everybody. One second. Okay. There we go. That is a link to a short article that you can often read. Again, it's, it's short. Spend just a few minutes uh, going through it. Um, Hello, Peter. Just hello. Yes, hello. <laughs> Claire, do you know is the uh, is the chat history available to people that are just hopping in? Um, or I no. So I'll you can send it again or I can send it again. Whatever. Yeah. And then I'll send the Zendo form again. 
You can find it. There we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, is that the original Airtable sign up? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, it's a sign up for the uh, software you'll be using. Um, Neil, could you check um, the Melody channel real quick? I don't know if it's... Okay, um, how many of you can you know, like just throw hands up? Are most people done reading, speed readers aside. Looking at you, Claire. <laughs> okay, um, does anybody have any thoughts they wanna like share? Feel free to hop in without stepping on turns, like initial thoughts on the article, stuff that stands out to you. Uh, things that you are like, oh, yeah. Uh, I'll send yeah. that link. Okay. Initial thoughts in the article. Um, um, so I'm a musician actually on the side. So whenever I'm finished doing work or coding or whatever, I just sit down and play ukulele. So this is pretty much preaching to what I already do. <laughs> this is like someone completely understands it where you kind of have to switch your mentality pretty much. So you go from constantly, you know, like what you were saying about overthinking, picking and analyzing every single variable because you have to be on top of everything when you work. But um, then when you create a thing, it's just like a state of flow. Anybody else, Any anybody like this article resonate with them or like on the opposite, just like not resonate with them? Does anyone else, this is trash or this is awesome. Any, any polar uh, viewpoints on that? Yeah, so um, I agree with everything in the article. Uh, you know, oftentimes I would spend too much time on just one thing. And I think you do have to diversify, you know, uh, what your activity is. Uh, one thing that I just thought was funny was um, it said, when you think too much, your brain starts to shut down certain areas of your consciousness, which causes you to become more passive and less productive. On top of this, your attention span de decreases due to being constantly bombarded with information. How do we combat this? And then it said the simple answer is creative thinking. <laughs> For some reason, I thought uh, the answer would be machine learning. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, other than that, um, I thought this was very uh, interesting. And I agree with it 100%. Anyone else? I would also agree about the point where if you spend too much time doing something, even if it's like a creative thing that you really like, um, like when I do that, I feel really burnt, burnt out. So I do agree about the whole, like, keep it to less than two hours a day or so. Yeah. Sometimes it's good to get to like alternate, switch it up. You got to like change tasks or at least take breaks frequently. We do that like every couple hours. Totally agree. Um, anybody else, anybody else got some thoughts on this? Uh, Anybody feeling like this is like, like stuff they've read before? You see kind of like articles like this online a lot, like those like self-help clickbaity kind of stuff, right? Like anybody feeling that way when they read it? No, nobody? I mean, usually I like to have kind of some kind of research to kind of prove the point that's like in the article. So I was kind of missing that. But other than that, I was kind of, I agreed with everything here. 
All right, take like one or two more thoughts. Anybody else have some thoughts they want to share? Yeah, that's a good point that normally you see like some citations or something like that, or or in a in a in a high quality version of this article, you see some citations. I say it's I say it's not self help until you try to sell me a book at the end. So and you didn't, so it's not self help. Um. Fair, fair. Uh, anybody else? For we'll move on in a sec. Okay, um, well, the interesting thing about this article is that it was actually written by a machine learning model, word for word. Human didn't write it. Um, this was written by, uh, I don't know anything Jordan Peterson, who was actually the, yeah, GPT-3, watch my, yeah, so this is really interesting what you're pointing out here, Kai, is that like, there's a reason this might remind you of other people's writing, and it's that GPT-3 was trained on all of the text from websites linked to from Reddit with at least three karma. So these pattern, these like modern day neural networks are generally like really, really good pattern recognition systems, particularly with GPT-3, which has come out by OpenAI, which some of you I think might've heard of, that like, we tend to, generally in ML today, we don't have good, our models don't have good contextual understanding. Like for example, if I show a model like GPT-3, which is a giant transformer that won't even fit on one or a few GPUs, like it has to be spread across multiple because of how much space it takes up. Um, it's got I, like billions of parameters. Um, I forget what the latest version is that, but they just keep like stacking more layers and adding more parameters. And what we found is that like, they become really, really good at basic tasks. Now, like, what is a transformer? I'm going to post a link here to an article again, just because we've got limited time. I want to give you some resources that, like, if you want to dive deeper, you can. Um, transformers are really big sequence processing models. So they'll intake, which, like, you think text might fit really well into. So you see them a lot. Yeah, in natural and big language processing or natural language processing. Um, but, like, they can work on other things too. Generally, they take they they take a sequence of, of what people often call tokens. Um, they turn them into something we call uh, an embedding uh, or, or or a coding, and often in this case, it's text. You get some sort of like large vector out of the other side, and the model has downstream like events, uh, downstream um, parts of the neural network, different layers, tend to do, like learn to do different things with that embedding that it generates in this case for text. But we've actually seen in the last couple of months, uh, particularly OpenAI released a couple of papers that do this with images as well. So it's not just big language processing that people are using transformers on. They figured out ways to turn images effectively into uh, a form of data, like a series uh, or a sequence of, of tokens that, that, uh, that the model can learn an embedding for as well. And then they said, hey, maybe we can have a transformer that understands both text and image embeddings. And so now they've got uh, a couple more that you can look up on OpenAI's site. One's called Dolly, D-A-L-L-E, -L -L -E, um, that you can say like, show me an armchair that looks like an avocado. And it will, has, it under, has enough understanding of text and their correlations to images that it will start generating images. Like this one, gen like this version GPT generates this whole article, generates text, start generating images that look like an armchair that looks like an avocado. And it's like, pretty good. It's surprisingly good. Um, I'll share this link as well. Uh, but I think it's fun to read this article out of context, um, assume it was written by a human and realize the current state of advanced machine learning and artificial intelligence. That being said, there are still huge shortcomings. Um, there are really, really good pattern recognition skills. Does this model understand a lot of the context it's discussing? Well, it didn't give us like references, right? Like it didn't like, it, it might've like related things really well, but like generally speaking, um, there's some like, there is some context missing, although it presents the idea of context really, really well. Like we have this like relatively deep article for what you would think a model might be able to write with like pretty coherent sentence structures and paragraph structures. Sometimes it says something where like, well, that's not what I thought it was gonna say, or that was like totally what I, how I would say that. It's a little wordy and kind of rambly, but like that's what it was trained on, right? Like it was trained on just like tons and tons of text from the internet, not all of which is like super strong prose. Um, so, so this is this is really cool. Um, I want to jump into like other large uh, applications um, right now as well. 
does anybody have any questions about this before we jump into those, right? Because we're just kind of, I kind of want to like throw a bunch of like big topics at you and then we're going to dive into actually like using one version of ML. Is anyone here familiar with something we call GANs, generative adversarial networks? Yes, Claire. GANs are really cool. Um, they, they make something out of almost nothing. They do. Just like the name implies, uh, they tend to be generative. Style GAN is a really popular one. I see someone posting in the chat. I just sent you a link to a website called thispersondoesnotexist.com. It is a list. It's just a stream of faces. If you, every time we refresh the, page, refresh the page, a new face loads, that's style GAN generated. Style GAN is a large generative adversarial network made by NVIDIA, published open source for non-commercial use. You can train it, you can play with it. Um, and generative adversarial networks are interesting. They're, they're very different than transformers. All common denominator across all of these is they tend to have a lot of, of uh, like similar um, layers and often have components of CNS in them or convolutional neural networks or some type of feed forward neural network. But the way they all work together and fit together uh, can be pretty different. Aurora, yes. Um, if these are, are, are people that don't exist, how do they look so real? That's a great question. So let me uh, post a link as I answer that question. And how is it certain that it won't like change, somebody won't change to look like that person? Okay, so good question. So Rory's, Rory's broader question is, uh, how does it know how to generate people that look so real? Um, and how does it know, and the second part was, how does it know, or what was the second part of that question? Um, like maybe somebody looks similar to this person and they like get a haircut or something and then they're that person. Yeah, which is possible because this is these are statistical models and they tend to be probabilistic by nature and like not deterministic. And so um, your first question is, how does it know how to do this? Well, a generative, I just posted a link for how generative adversarial networks work. High level concept is this network has sort of two pieces again, uh, inside of it competing against each other. There's like, a, there's a discriminator network. There's like, a, there's a generator and like it's adversary in a sense. So the, you have one network that's sitting here trying to generate images that look like a set of training data you gave it. So like I give this model during training, like millions of images of pictures of people's faces, let's say. Um, and during the training process, you have like one part of the network trying to generate things that would probabilistically fit the set that it was shown. So it like wants to try to generate new images pixel by pixel that like would are similar to this set of training data that you showed it, in this case, human faces. And then you have um, this like other network basically that's trying to determine like if it fits the set or not. Um, and basically the training process converges on, can this network generating faces that fit the set fool the thing that's trying to not be fooled and thereby making this generator really, really good at generating the things that fit the set. Um, so that is this adversarial component of these generative adversarial networks. Make sense, Aurora? That was a very oversimplified explanation of general, generative adversarial networks. Here's a 3000 word article that goes deeper into those. Um, again, limited time. So I want to try to give you resources that you can take outside of this and go a little deeper into these things. Um, Thank you, makes sense. So cool concept, right? I think this was developed, and I could be wrong here. Don't quote me on this, but I, if I remember right, this was uh, a, this original concept of these of these adversarial networks was developed by a guy named I think Ian Goodfellow, a famous deep learning practitioner. Um, and this was like this, this was like a pretty groundbreaking approach uh, to neural networks. So I like to do some really cool stuff. Anybody have any other questions so far uh, on what we talked about?
All right. We're, I'm going to screen share. We're going to look at something else real quick. Um, oh, sorry, I see we have some questions. Uh, can I make an AI code for you? Someone asked a little bit ago. In theory, yes, people have been using GPT-3 to do that. Code is kind of like language. Uh, it's like a sequence of characters. So uh, people, there are people that have made train GPT-3, the model that generated that article, to generate code for them based on different inputs. Um, so this is something that like we will certainly see in our lifetimes where like AI gets pretty good at writing code for us, I would predict. Like I think we'll see some, we'll see some of that. Um, it won't like replace humans, but can take away, or I would imagine take away a lot of the legwork or at least like predict the code you were going to write just like you're, you might in text messaging or in like Google Doc, right? So like imagine like you're coding in your text editor and like your text editor is like, ah, you're probably, you know, making like this type of for loop and this definition right now. And I see you passing these things in and one of them is an array. So like, let me just make that loop for you. Like you could imagine at least like that being a more short-term thing rather than AI just writing code for us. Um, second question was how does unsupervised learning work? Great question. Um, there are a number of different ways unsupervised learning work. GPT work, GPT-3 is an example of unsupervised learning. The high level definition of unsupervised learning um, is best paired with what supervised learning is. So supervised learning is what we will do in Zendo today. For example, I label a bunch of data. I'm like, here are images and here are images of Marvel characters. And like, this is Spider-Man. That's like Iron Man. This is Baby Groot. That's like Adult Groot. Um, and then the model, like based on the, the data I've shown it that is labeled, it's like, okay, show me some new images. Like, I think that's Baby Groot. I don't see anything I know in here. Uh, that's definitely Iron Man. And that is an example of supervised learning. It's like human labeled, supervised learning process, right? Like the model only knows what we show it and it needs structured data that has been human labeled to learn a thing that we want to do. GPT-3 on the other hand was fed unlabeled data. It was fed piles of text and GPT-3 started to learn things about that text without humans telling it explicit, explicit things about this text. Like there was no, this is a subject, this is a predicate, this is the letter T. Like there were no annotations in that text. It was just, unstructured, unlabeled data. Um, and that is really wild. So GPT-3 and transformer neural networks are an example of unsupervised learning. If you read that transformer neural network article, um, I think you'll get a little bit deeper of an answer to the question of like how, the more of the how. Um, a lot of what we see today is supervised learning. Um, unsupervised learning is becoming a lot more popular. What's the big attraction of unsupervised learning? Labeling data is really hard. It's not that fun. It takes tons of energy. These models tend to be really data hungry, so that can be kind of an arduous task. Um, unsupervised learning is really attractive because you just throw a lot of resources at it and a bunch of data at it, and it kind of figures stuff out as it goes, right? So attractive concept at a really high level. Um, now I want to talk about uh, generally a different type of neural network. It's a little bit more common these days. You see aspects of this in self-driving. You see it in if you have a smartphone and you have pictures in your smartphone and say you go type in people um, and it shows you, it filters all of your smartphone pictures that have people in them and you're like, wow, that's really cool. Or you like food and it finds all your pictures that have food in them. These are tagged by often convolutional neural networks. Um, high level oversimplified general way convolutional neural networks work. Um, say you want to classify an image. Um, you have this like big network of layers and each layer has different nodes and each one of these is gonna do some sort of different nonlinear mathematical op operation. Some of them convolutions, which is why they're called convolutional neural networks. Um, and that data is going to feed into the next layer, into the next layer, and these nonlinear operations will keep happening. And often what comes out of a network that's going to just classify an image, like say I want to show it um, images of the world around me and I have categories like baseball field or stadium or beach, like general scene categories like that. Um, the model, if I've human labeled them, because it will be supervised learning, will learn to classify those with enough data. Um, as you feed images during the training process through this neural network, it learns how to generate basically a giant high dimensional mathematical vector that is representative of that image and the rich features in that image that it thinks are meaningful. There's then a subsequent layer often in this neural network that starts to learn the classes associated um, 
with uh, or it starts to learn classes for the things that you told it to learn like it'll have a class for baseball field and a class for for beach and what's effectively happening is um, uh and this would be meaningful for more of us you depending on the the level of math that you've taken but it creates basically a space in this high dimensional uh vector space for that class um and as then after it's been trained and that space gets more refined and it starts to understand like okay like mathematically speaking images that are tagged beach i've seen like have these features that fall into this vector space based on this high dimensional vector i've turned an image into and like once that are baseball fields like i've got this other little vector space over here for that and then when i pass new images to it it's never seen before after the training process when i want to apply it in the real world have it classify new images for me it's going to go like oh okay like i've got this new image i'm like really good at turning images into high dimensional vectors i'm going to turn it into this high dimensional vector and it's like bam does it fit any of these classes and it's going to say how close is it to any of these classes mathematically speaking in that vector space what is the distance from these classes and if it's confident that it's pretty close to one of these classes it's going to say hey this image belongs to this class um we see a lot of convolutional neural networks action in the world around us they're part of self-driving if you're identifying vehicles around you or cones or general object recognition things like that um I'm going to field some of these questions that are coming in. Um, how do they know it's the same person? Example, uh, how do they know the same person? For example, um, let's say in one photo I have a pink dress and braids, um, and in another I have a yellow shirt. How can photos tell it's the same person? Okay, so this is this question um, about how are people differentiated by neural networks is more specific to facial recognition. Often is the solution for that. So for facial recognition. Uh, one common way this is done is they use a convolutional neural network, like I talked about, that will detect the face itself, like just find the face. Um, and then they'll use a subsequent neural network to take that face and generate a really high dimensional vector for that face. And then they will do um, some sort of search, often something called K nearest neighbor possibly, to see if that vector that was generated for that face is similar mathematically to other faces that you already know about. So let's say like I've got like, a picture of Claire's face and it's in a database and I've like run a bunch of mathematical operations on it. And I've got this like vector and I'm like, that's my face vector for Claire. And then like, I've got a security camera upside outside the Angel Hacks headquarters and like people are walking by and like cameras watching and like running images through my neural network that finds faces and generates face vectors. And I'm like running those through a database and comparing faces, face vectors to Claire's face vectors. So I'm like, I'm trying to find Claire like and all of a sudden, boom, Claire walks in and her face gets vectorized, sent to the database. And my algorithm's like, wow, that vector is super close to this vector that I know is Claire. And it returns this response that like, that's Claire's face. That's generally how it doesn't use necessarily the other features in the image. And that's how it differentiates from like, if you changed your hair or you have a different shirt on or something like that. What's better on supervised or supervised learning? They have trade-offs. Um, supervised learning is, you know, like works super well, uh, it's starting to work better on low amounts of data. Unsupervised learning is really nice because like you don't have to label data and that's pretty time consuming. Um, also, you have this idea that this model can learn stuff on its own with less human interaction. Pretty attractive idea. Um, theoretical articles. Uh, yeah, so someone's asking about theoretical articles on ML. Um, we have a section on our website at deepai.org that is a trending list of all of the latest open source research coming out of academia that's published to archive.org uh, that is basically curated by the community, right? Like the things that get the most upvotes and hearts and reshares and stuff like that bubbles to the top here. So this is a trending list of stuff published in the last 30 days. It's pretty cutting edge research. It's all mathematics, data science, machine learning uh, adjacent fields. Um, Someone's asking about videos. Uh, so if you wanna analyze a person's movement in videos, uh, one way people analyze videos uh, commonly is they just break them into frames and analyze them as images um, and over time. So you've got some like basically like a series of frames over time and you analyze each frame and you're using an object recognition algorithm. Um, you could, you're then effectively just breaking an a video into frames. There are some more advanced algorithms people do with cross frame analysis um, where they might analyze individual frames, but then try to like, use a different type of neural network to look at time series components for changes in data over time. Um, I can't speak 
pretty too in depthly about how some of those modern techniques are working for cross frame analysis and videos. But um, I know that is a, a direction that's becoming um, at least somewhat more common. And you can imagine the self driving, very common and necessary because not only do you want to find a person, for example, coming into view, you also want to try to predict if they're about to walk in front of the car in a crosswalk or something like that. So like there's some more advanced applications, um, video becomes more meaningful and not just, you know, is there a person in this frame? Um, Uh, someone's asking about different image formats. Um, so uh, this is a good question. Um, the model will learn what you show it and what you use in your training data for a supervised learning model, for a model that's going to learn through supervised learning images, for example, that you give it that are human labeled. Um, you want the training data to be representative of the environment that you want to apply the model in. So if I want my model to analyze satellite imagery and find all of the building footprints in Los Angeles, I should probably train it on satellite imagery that's a similar spectral resolution. So like maybe the same RGB spectrum as what I'm gonna feed it in, in reality. Or if I only have or had grayscale, like I should train it on grayscale. Um, another way to think about this, aside from just your training environment should match the what you wanna to analyze in the real world is um, Think about images uh, for image analysis for specific, specific question. Think about um, your training data, not just in the volume of training data, not just in the number of examples, but the density of data. So does a black and white image have more data or does a color image have more data? Does a really high, like high def image with a lot of pixel density have more data or does like a low resolution image have more data? Naturally, like something that has more color, more pixels, more information is going to have more data, and that gives your model more information to learn off of. Um, again, still best to train your model with something that's representative in, as a general rule of thumb of the environment that you want to apply it, that you want to apply it in. Um, a higher resolution image does tend to help the model and might help you compensate in a lower resolution environment. That being said, this I would not say this is like, you know, a default truism. Like if your training data is radically different than what you want to apply it on the environment, you're not just going to like sneak a better model and necessarily by training on some super high res images and then showing it stuff that's like never seen before that's really low res right like you might be better off training on low res imagery that's a representative of your real world data or sometimes mixing like mix some other stuff in but like you want it to have seen stuff that's representative of your real world applications um because that's what you want to apply it to so these models like i said going back to the beginning of that article these models only know what we show them they generalize a little bit but like by and large, um, they're really, really good at pattern, rec pattern recognition, and, and they tend to know what we what we show them. Um, there is some carryover from other tasks we might have shown them, but it's in general, uh, we're not super good at highly generalized models um, or avoiding a scenario often called in the industry as cat catastrophic forgetting, meaning as you train on new things, you tend to like wipe out older weights and information to uh, to the point where like they're not uh, they're they're the model's not quite as good at them anymore. So. Um, show the model what you want it to work well on. If you want it to work well on satellite imagery, that's RGB and 50 meters per pixel, show it satellite imagery, that's RGB, 50 meters per pixel. Um, if you want it to work on like Marvel characters, uh, which we can like look at in a second here, which might be kind of fun, um, like, and you want it to work on not just like modern movie Marvel characters, but also like old pictures of comics, like probably include some old comic pictures in your training data, or it might not do so hot. Um, this is a good general rule of thumb for using modern machine learning. Have your training data be representative of what you want to apply in the environment, whether you're using some structured data analysis algorithm, whether you're using um, unstructured data analysis algorithm, images are unstructured in a sense. Um, whatever it is, have it be representative. Um, okay, so I'm gonna jump into what it might look like to train a model to recognize objects in images. Uh, bear with me one sec, I'm gonna start sharing my screen.
Bear with me just one more moment. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so this is Zendo. Um, this is a platform that you can easily upload images to, label them uh, like this, just by clicking. Um, select the mask tool, draw something around it, complete it, and I'm gonna say baby group. I've got my list of classes here that I've added, um, different Marvel characters I wanna teach the model how to detect, I'm going to go through and label some images. And as you can see, like we've done that here a little bit. Um, we've gone through and we've labeled some pictures of Black Panther, drew a mask around him point by point, called it Black Panther, um, done this with Iron Man, um, done this with Baby Groot, done this with Spider Man, done this with Rogue a little bit, some old, some old X Men pictures, um, some newer X Men pictures, uh, done with a little bit of the Hulk too. So we've got a few characters in here, um, including Baby Groot again. So. This is an example of a convolutional neural network being trained with no code, um, just an interface where you can upload images, outline the things in it you want the model to learn how to detect, give them labels. Um, it trains itself in the background automatically, so you don't have to like worry about spinning up a training pipeline. You don't have to manage a GPU. You don't have to have a GPU. This is running on a server with a GPU already. Um, it just kind of works trains a model for you, deploys that model for you, and then you can use it a couple of ways. Um, you can use it, let me move these images out of my way. Um, you can use it here in the dashboard, uh, or you can use the API as well. It gives you a little API endpoint for your tasks that you've trained um, and some curl examples to post it. It's really simple. Um, you can do this in a number of languages and anybody who wants it, I can give them some other language examples of how to post this. You can use it with JavaScript. You could do it with Node.js. You could do it with, I think we even allow you to do it from the front end um of a website so if you're not building a back end for your quick hackathon app like you could do that here um you could do this for uh let's see i think like tons of different stuff tristan's got some cool ideas for recognizing like written characters and images um some really cool applications there um we've seen people use this on like where's waldo for example so like finding waldo and pictures of where's waldo i don't know if everyone's familiar with where's waldo but super fun and also painful task um there's tons of different applications. You can use it for satellite imagery, for user for finding like defects in manufacturing pipelines. Um, people use it to uh, do all kinds of imagery analysis to like detect people. Like one of the students, one of our classes, it wants us to like create an alarm for when his so he knows when his sister's walked into his room. So he wants like his as like as like computer camera running, pointing this door, taking a picture like every second, and it, like whatever detects you know. A person walking to his room when he's not going in there. I was like, oh, my sister walked to my room. Um, so there's like tons of cool stuff you can do with this, right? Like tons of interesting stuff. Um, let's take a little bit of like, like a quick look at like how this sort of works, right? Like, so um, I'm going to go through here. I'm going to upload some pictures. Let's say I want to like label another picture of uh, label a couple more of the Hulk, and maybe one of the Black Panther. So I'm just going to upload these. They're going to get uploaded super fast, easy. Um, and because I've already labeled some images, Zendo is just gonna like start suggesting labels for me at some point too. Like you can see here, like these are some suggested labels. Like I got Spider-Man, didn't do that great. Got this other person, definitely not Spider-Man. So I'm gonna delete that. Um, maybe I'll leave this one. Maybe I decide I don't wanna redraw that picture. Um, maybe I want to draw a new picture. Often you can go through and label point by point. You wanna make sure your masks are generally like somewhat accurate. Um, the model will learn better. It uses everything within the masks. Um, that uh, to learn that class like we talked about, like it breaks that image up um, into some giant high dimensional vector. And then it's gonna try to learn um, your class as well, specific to that. Um, 
Claire used this on a really cool tool or on a really cool application that I actually have in here as well. We can show you is to detect um, different types of brain tumors and MRI right. scans on brains. I think that was your synthesis project a couple years back. Um, and we didn't have like quite a sweet uh, tool at the time for that, but um, now it's a little bit easier than it was when you did it. Okay, so general idea, you get it, this is the Hulk. Uh, I'm going to finish this and we're going to be like, cool, that's the Hulk. You press escape, it completely completes the mask for you. And I'm like, cool, there's the Hulk. And every time I make changes, the model's going to start retraining itself in the background to like update for my changes. And we can see too, like, I, I like, because this model's already been trained a little bit, like, we've already, once you label like five or so examples, it's going to start pre labeling examples for you. Like, here, it already like found Black Panther for me. So, like, I don't even need to like draw Black Panther. I'm just gonna make a change so that uh, um, this model, this like these masks get accepted. I, up in the corner here, I can click accept suggested labels. I'm gonna set, accept those. I'm like, dang, that's a really good mask, but it's not Spider-Man, it's the Hulk. So I'm gonna change that. And this isn't anybody that's a false positive, we would call it. So I'm gonna delete, I'm gonna delete that mask. Um, great, right? Like, wow, my labeling job just got so much easier. Once I labeled like 10 images, like now I'm just kind of like correcting Zendo as I go, right? So like, this is watching a neural network go through two processes almost kind of at the same time. It's, I'm training it, like I'm showing it examples so it can learn in a supervised environment. And then it's going through the images I haven't labeled yet. And it's like producing inferences on them. Um, something it can only do once it's been trained. And it's like, hey, I think that's the Hulk. I think that's Spider-Man. And I'm like correcting it. And then it's retraining itself on those examples. So really quick, easy way to get a model trained up pretty quickly. Um, you could do this to detect blocks in Minecraft of different kinds because you want to create a Minecraft bot that's overcomplicated and use computer vision because that sounds fun. Like that would be an example. I don't know if you need it, but you could do it. Um, let's see, let's see. Uh, some person detection stuff, glioma identifier. Yeah, so this is Claire's project, uh, super cool. Also, you can see as Zendo gets smarter, like his garden starts to grow, like some bamboo pops up, he starts to levitate a little bit. Um, cool little stuff like that happens, so we're trying to make it fun. Um, if you want to use Zendo in the dashboard and see how it's doing, like say you've trained it and like you've got a bunch of images um, you want to upload, uh, you can do that here aside from just using an API. Um, you should be able to go over it over here um, and you can upload new images. These are inferences, right? Like I can't edit these masks. This is stuff that Zendo has produced. You can see Claire's model doing pretty well. That's I think a false positive, right Claire? Yeah. That's yeah. False, positive. false so, positives are I'm going kind of unfortunate. Through, it is unfortunate, but this model's only seen 20 images. Remember you labeled 750 last time to get results like this? 20. Uh, so we can be like a little more forgiving on this model because it didn't see 750. It's yeah, I so remember like, when I used to do this, um, there was a lot of hand labeling involved over the weekend. Very tiring. I, I'm basically a radiologist now. <laughs> yeah, right, basically. And maybe also have some carpal tunnel from having to label for 750 images straight. Um, so what do I do? I like see that Zendo's got this error and I'm like, well, that's not what I want to find, that's not a glioma. It thinks it's glioma. Well, I'm gonna click this little button now and it says, add to training data. Then it's like, wow, added to training data. And then I'm gonna go back over here to the train side and I'm gonna see, cool, that image is over there. I'm gonna delete that false positive. This one's super good. That is in fact a glioma. And now this has changed from pink to blue or magenta to blue. And it is included in my training data. All these pink labels, these are, I must've added it twice. Um, I do that, I can just delete. Nice little handy delete button, right click there on an image. Um, great stuff like that. This is effectively a nice file finder. You can search, filter, um, look through data that you have. Um, you can filter by label count, by labels, by date modified, date uploaded. You can include only things that have realms in them, uh, which is everything in this. At this point, you can include things that are unlabeled, which we don't have any unlabeled images. Um, so try to be like a really handy tool. Why do we have this? A lot of you have some software engineering experience. You might be like, well, I'm way more interested in like pulling TensorFlow out, learning how to use PyTorch or TensorFlow. I see there's some open source models out there like YOLO, like I'm gonna train something up. It's a it's an arduous process. Like, and I, I encourage you to do it. Um, and there are cases where you need like a bespoke solution. Um, what have we removed from the process for you here? 
there are no knobs to turn. You don't have to like normalize your labeled data. You've got a really easy tool to do it here. The neural network just ingests your labels. You don't have to like get your, like do a bunch of like data engineering tasks, move your data around. You don't need access to a GPU. Like there's tons of benefits to just doing something like this. It's really easy. It's all on a dashboard. It's all GUI based. Um, I encourage everybody who's interested to go play around with TensorFlow. If you want to drop me an email to peter at deep AI.org. Everyone's free to do that. Happy to answer questions that you have. Uh, if I don't respond, I apologize in advance. Feel free to ping me again. Um, sometimes that happens more frequently than I'd like to admit, but happy to answer questions you have, point you in the right direction. Um, this is a great way for you to get started. And I thought this might be cool to show you because like not I can talk to you about neural networks all day and we can read articles about neural networks all day and I can show you pictures all day, but like here's one that you can without spending a bunch of time doing data engineering tasks data normalization tasks or writing any code um, for the training process or for the inference process or for the hosting process, like you can just learn what it's like to teach a neural network. You can start to develop some intuition around what makes good training data. What happens if I like don't include images um, that are super representative of my training data? What happens if I like train on really high res images but want to apply it to low res images? Like what happens if I only have 50 training examples. I'm moving really fast, but I need something to work. What happens if I want to give it a really hard task, like trying to break captures? What happens if I like want to, I don't know, anything like that, right? Like normally the barrier to entry to, to answer those questions would be really high. Um, you have to write a bunch of code. You'd have to get your data together. You'd have to find a way to label it. You'd have to get it in a form that the model can digest during training. You'd overcome a bunch of errors because let's be honest, using other people's code on GitHub, not a turnkey solution would be nice if it was, rarely is, love all the code on GitHub, but hard to get going fast. So that's what we're looking for. Does anybody have any questions, things they might wanna, can they use this in a project? Uh, what would be a good application? Um, general questions about what we've covered, just about machine learning broadly today. Um, I know we've been moving fast, short amount of time. Um, like to take the last 10 minutes to try to clear up any confusion or, um, uh, general questions people have. Aurora. What's the most advanced thing AI can do? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think it depends on how you define advanced. Um, I would say, like, do you want to talk about, like, there are certain things AI can do where um, it's superhuman, like it's better than humans. Um, and there are certain things AI can do not quite as well as humans. And there are certain things AI is starting to be able to do better than humans. I would say self-driving is possibly one of the more difficult and interesting tasks that um, it's starting to be as good as humans at. Um, some would probably argue there are certain ways in which it is better. You can imagine like very, very soon in a, in a not too distant future, it's gonna be, significantly better than humans, um, right? Like computers don't get tired. Like computers didn't not get enough sleep last night. Computers didn't need more caffeine before they drove, like computers, all that stuff, right? So like, I think self-driving is a really, a really good example of something that it will be superhuman at. Yes, yeah, see people posting about Alpha Zero, uh, about Alpha Zero, um, playing Dota and Go. Um, it's certainly AI has like become very impressive at crushing humans in these games. It's defeated some of the top players in the world. Um, these are also very complicated tasks. Um, and you could argue that like generating images based on a text input is also a really complicated task. Um, I can't, I, I, it's not something humans do as fast as a model does and sometimes not even as well. Like I think, you know, a lot of what OpenAI has, has produced for things where you can give it a text description, like, um, like, uh, show me armchairs that look like an avocado. Uh, and it will generate better art than I can make that it's an armchair that looks out like an avocado. And even if I was that good, I can generate what like an image, say I'm really good with design tools. Like when I'm gonna make like an image every 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe I'm like, wanna go further and make something high quality. Maybe I'm an image an hour. Can generate... Most prolific artist in all of 20, in the entire century. Yeah, open AI, just cruising through images, multiple a second. and. There isn't really a limit there because you can just spin up more servers with more instances of this avocado armchair image generator and you can spit, you know, a relative, effectively an infinite number of images out a second, and, you know, limit being how many, how many servers you have, how many models you have, stuff like that. So um, I'd say those are pretty impressive. Uh, any other questions? Um, so 
our team is doing audio rather than images, but we're still using like a convolutional type network. And we want to do some uh, some few shot learning. So we're thinking of doing some transfer learning by freezing all but like top layers. Are there any like better techniques do you think that are still feasible in like uh, the hackathon time period that we could look into? By top layers, do you mean the base network or do you mean the head of the network? The head of the network, which does the classification. Gotcha. Um, you could, if you might be able to find a base net and you, maybe you're already using one uh, that was pre-trained as well. So rather than randomly initializing the weights uh, or having them set to zero, uh, that could that could be a way that could give you a jump. Um, that like basic transfer learning like that is, is kind of a, a fast way to, to, to do that. So I'd say you're on the right track. Um, there might be some audio, I'm less familiar with some of the more modern audio networks out there. Like, so there might be some pre-trained stuff um, that, that, I'm, that I'm not familiar with, but I'd say you're on the right track. You can try freezing the top layers. Um, generally, I would say you want to freeze the base net because you want a better embedding. Um, uh, yeah. Or not, not sorry, not, sorry, not freeze the base net. Um, uh, just start with a base net that's pre-trained um, that you can train on top of. Uh, so that might be um, something to look at. And this is really common for like image tasks as well for a lot of networks. Like there's generally you take that bottom part of the net I mentioned where you might take an image and generate like a big feature map or big like high dimensional vector that's representative of, of that image mathematically. Um, generally people are using a pre-trained net uh, for that. Like usually ResNet is a common base um, for, for a lot of these image tasks. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to reach out if you guys have other questions. Happy to happy to help you get started on stuff. Sounds like a cool project. Uh, I will send everybody who put their uh, Claire. Did you show that form again? Uh, the Zendo one. Yeah, let's sign cool. up the gotcha. air table. Uh, you can drop your name in this form if it's not already, and uh, it's like shortly here. I'll I'll get everybody invites out tonight. Um, bear with me. I've been like. Uh, working all day and stuff and visiting customers' offices and traveling. So um, I will sometime in the next few hours get invites out to everybody. Um, does that work or is this like a, people are, I'm assuming you're starting to work on stuff like now, right? Like people are hacking. Okay, cool. So I'll get stuff out to you guys shortly here um, after this call, start receiving invites. Uh, <laughs> next thing you know, <laughs> Yeah, uh, Emily Lee, great question. Methods to verify your model and how to choose the correct ones. You mean this is a general question about like training a machine learning model uh, in general or uh, or do you have specific tasks to mind, like a classification task, for example? Uh, okay, so for classification, um, let me, I've actually got some articles here that I'll help you with this. Um, so classification tasks, uh, we tend to talk about um, accuracy in terms of, of two concepts called precision and recall. There's actually in academia, you see people use a metric called mean average precision or average precision. Um, I'm not a big fan of that method. I think it's doesn't in practice, like out in the real world, um, it doesn't give you like a great gauge of like where your model is getting better and where it's getting worse. Like your model could get really good at finding stuff, but start producing tons of false positives and your mean average precision might go up. The value was like, the why, why then why is everyone using it? One might ask. Well, like for as far as like I'm concerned, the value of mean average precision is that everybody uses it. So for academic papers, it provides like a really nice baseline. I'm like, this guy's like all on Coco or on ImageNet, like I got this mean average precision and this guy's like, well, and I got this one. And so it gives you a good baseline. So that's like super valuable, meaningful. But we're talking about how can I pick the best version of my model? You probably have a production task you're applying it to. I would recommend using things like precision and recall. So let's talk about like what these are. Precision is the number of true positives your model predicted. So we're talking about, I gave the model an image and it gave me an output. Um, Actually, let me share my screen real quick because I have a better um, way to demo this. Um, okay, so I have an image here. 
this model predicted, like we were looking at a second ago, that this is a glioma. That is not the glioma. Clara, what is that? Corpus callosum? Uh, no, that's the uh, substantia nigra or brainstem, I guess. Okay, so that is, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's in the center. Corpus callosum would probably be somewhere here and not visible in this slide. Um, okay, so I don't even know if it'd be visible in MRI at all. I'm not sure if they're detailed enough. Um, okay, so this is not a glioma. This is probably the brainstem. That's this is what we would. If call that was a glioma, a then we would all be dead. <laughs> We're all screwed. Uh, thankfully not. Uh, this is what we would call a false positive. So the model has been trained. I gave it a new image, and it made two predictions. It said that's a glioma, and that's a glioma. This is a classification task. It's trying to classify objects within the image. Um, so we call this a false positive. Um, we would call this a true positive because that is in fact a glioma and it predicted correctly that that's a glioma. And the mask I would say is probably almost 100% overlapped with what a true mask would be for there, like the ground truth, meaning the human labeled glioma. So um, why am I showing you this? Well, for to calculate precision, like in the article I shared, that is the, I'm going to look at this again so I don't get it wrong. That's the number of true positives. So we got one true positive divided by the number of true positives that the model predicted, which is also one, plus the number of false positives. So how many false positives do we have? We have one false positive in this image. We have one true positive, which basically means our precision is one divided by two or 50%. Um, so the precision for this model for, for this model on this image. Now, normally you would calculate accuracy metrics across like a, a variety of images for a classification model. Yeah, I might want to give it 50 of these that of like a diverse set of scenarios it might see to really determine how well it's performing in the wild. So for to remember statistics, easy to fake really good metrics because you just give it stuff that's cherry picked that you know it's going to perform well on, right? But like not a really good way to make sure you have a good model. You want to give it stuff that's representative of difficult cases it'll see in the wild and stuff that might and like common cases. So give it a good breadth of what it sees. So my precision for this is 50%. It's a 50% precision here or one over two. Um, what is my recall? My recall is my number of true positives divided by my number of true positives plus my false negatives, meaning the number of correct predictions the model made for a given set divided by the number of possible correct predictions. Because what's a false negative? A false negative is the model didn't predict something and it was wrong. For example, let's say the model had missed this glioma and that was in fact a glioma and it predicted nothing there. Um, but it got this other thing as a glioma, which was wrong. I would have this false positive still. And then this would be, there would be nothing here. So that would be a false negative. There was, a, there was a true detection, a true classification to be made, um, and it was missed. So it missed it, so it's negative, uh, or it didn't predict anything, so it's negative, and it was false to not predict anything, so it's false negative. Um, so what do we do for accuracy then? So we've got two ways to sort of think about accuracy in a classification model. We've got precision, which is basically like, of all of my predictions, how often am I right? So the numerator is true positives and false positives. So like predictions I made that were wrong, predictions I made that were right. So precision is how often am I right when of all the predictions I made, how many of them are correct. Recall is true positives divided by true positives plus false negatives. So recall is like of all the possible right answers, how many did I get right? Does this make sense? Um, Okay, so but like say we want a general number for accuracy. So this tells me like is the model making a bunch of false predictions and is the model missing stuff. So now I have two numbers to kind of gauge both. Um, say I want like a good average of these two things. Um, one common way that's not the mean average precision that I would recommend using is called the F score. What is the F score you ask? Great question. Um, the F score is Everybody's familiar with taking the average of something, right? Like basic arithmetic average, it's actually called. Um, you add up all of the numbers in a set and you divide by the number of numbers in that set. So if you have like 10 numbers and each one of them is one and then you would add all those up and you have the same number on the bottom and you take the average, right? Like arithmetic average, well-known, pretty simple. There are actually other types of means besides that. And in fact, the arithmetic mean that you know and love so dearly is just one of the three Pythagorean means. What are the other two Pythagorean means? Great question. 
the harmonic mean is one, very good at finding the central tendency of rates. So things that are like, you know, miles per hour, or in this case, precision, which is, you know, number divided by a number, number gives me a rate, often between zero and one, yes, harmonic and geometric means. Um, so the F score is actually, if you look closely, just the harmonic mean of your precision and your recall. So you're finding like with any mean, you want a good central tendency of your set of numbers. Central tendency being like a nice way to say the average. Um, if you want to sound really cool, start calling averages central tendencies in a set of numbers. Everyone's going to immediately think you're like that much cooler. Um, I've tried it. It works. Tried and tested. Um, so that's what the F score is, harmonic mean. Um, and these are ways I would recommend baselining your classification models on to try to pick the best checkpoint and the best model that you've trained. Um, Wait, is it just me or are you guys, are y'all not hearing anything? I yeah. can't hear anything. He's, he's gone. Yeah, I think you. Asked. <laughs> no, if he was Thanos, then like there would only be 50% of him left. Or at least we would have had some like cool dust animation on the, the camera, but no, he just, he just vanished. Maybe the camera got Thanos. He's been snapped. Clear ores. So sorry about that. Um. So, in the meantime, you guys. Want to play Hangman? No, Neil. Let's not play Hang. Yeah, I'm down. Where's on, Where's the form for my points? Because that's what we're all here for. If that is what you're here for, that's kind of sad. Not gonna lie. But okay. Anyways. Clear. Um, <laughs> okay. There I'm a there. disappointed father. Okay. <laughs> Right. If you were listening, you would have found it, I think, right? Well, I'm not a good listener. Mm. Okay, we're back. Um, that was a really funny way for me to cut out because that was actually the end of that uh, diatribe about how to evaluate classification models. So. Nice finish. Thanks. Good to be back. Great to see y'all. It's been a long time. Um, anybody else have questions? Concerns? Fears? AI desires? I do, Peter. Are you going to be on tomorrow for the uh, wildfire uh, workshop too? What time is it? Uh, I believe nine o'clock. I can be. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, because the, the, I think it would be super cool to start training some of these models and to be able to detect through, uh, you know, different plumes and stuff like that. Okay, cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll join tomorrow. Sounds fun. Thank you. Hi, Chantal. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you again. Likewise. This was Hi, very... Chantal. Hi. It was a very good presentation. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you so that. much for coming. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Oh, two other quick questions I'll answer. Just uh, someone's asking how to analyze uh, video from a phone or laptop. Um, live video is really hard without running the model locally on the phone or with a lot of resources in the cloud. So generally what I do to do video from a phone or laptop is like just take a picture of the phones from the phone like camera or video like every second or something like that and analyze like an image a second. Um, and that's a, a way to kind of in the short term do like live video stuff. Um, there are models like MobileNet that uh, you can sometimes, or like Apple has stuff in their suite that uh, you can run on phones, but um, at least for Zendo, uh, that's, uh, that would be a solution. You just use the API endpoint that's remote and take a picture like every second out of your video feed. Um, otherwise, yeah, MobileNet or Apple has some tools that you might be able to quickly train on image classifier to run locally on the phone. Um, MobileNet is, uh, an architecture optimized for mobile. Um, you can uh, find it. I, I can tell you the name of like Apple's version of this. Um, if you're doing iOS dev, uh, 
exactly the name of, uh, I think it's a core ML. So if you're doing iOS there, um, Apple's got this thing called core ML and makes it so you can run a neural network. Um, MobileNet, if you're using TensorFlow or Keras, they have some pre-trained MobileNet bases that you could train a task on top of. So you want to detect if there are people in an image on your phone, um, like live and video, uh, you might be able to train a mo quick MobileNet classifier. Uh, MobileNet is an architecture you can find in Keras. Um, Let me type that out. Uh, there's some Keras like kind of libraries for TensorFlow that are good for that. Um, it's a small, thin neural network that can run on a phone. Um, okay, that's all I got. Thanks for joining, everyone. Claire, anything else you want me to cover? No, I don't think so. Thanks for Thank having you, me. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Mr. Griggs. Thank you, Mr. Griggs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and I, thank you. If any of you guys want to join the movie night, there will be one um, at yes. eight p.m. PST. Where is it? Uh, I'll be sending out a link in a bit. We'll be watching Wally, -E. so I know Yay! most people have seen it, but come on. I watched. Watch. I I only watched like the second half, so I'm excited. Yeah, when I was a kid, I made a Wally -E robot out of paper and transmitters from uh, like a ro Radio Shack um, radio. It was like a tiny little robot with like printed parts and a nice frame and like a transmission. And I got an old game control and it was like moving around, very fun. And of oars. <laughs> Thanks. Wait, Claire, where's the form? Um, sorry, give me a second. Uh, is Neil like here? a while ago? Yeah, if you scroll up, you might find it. Mm. Oh, no. Anyway, he closed it anyway, so it's, like, gone. What? Oh, by the way, um, for those of people who, are, who think it's cooler, I don't know, uh, Hack Club is giving out free stickers to every single person that applies. Um, every single person, all of you. Um, so if you want, I will be sending out the link, and you can sign up there. We'll also be sending you swag packs, but they will be as well. Anyways, thanks for coming. Bye. Also, thanks. Mr. Griggs, is that a hotel room? Uh, no, it's an Airbnb, but it's a small Airbnb that looks like a hotel room. I'm in Los Angeles right now. <gasps> oh my gosh. Yeah. LA. Okay. Anyways, thanks everyone for coming. I'll just end it now. Uh, I'll make sure to post the recording as well. Okay. Are you okay with that, uh, um, Mr. Thank Riggs? You. Bye -bye. I'll Please. Show you, I'll show you my progress that I make tonight, tomorrow. Bye-bye. Awesome. Please do, Tristan. Also, Tristan, if you want to add me to your task, I'd love to take a look at it. Uh, if you oh, want to throw my Peter uh, at deepai.org. Uh, you asked for Nova email. Is that what you would like? Sure. That one works. Okay. Oh, you're an Astro Nova student. <laughs> because, yeah, anyways. Cool. Bye. I'll end the meeting now. Yeah, bye-bye.